Before Starship becomes truly operational, the process of low Earth orbit refueling is going to have to be mastered. But what a lot of people don't realize is the refueling process is going to be very important to build a presence on the moon even without Starship. A network of communications and navigation satellites is going to be absolutely essential to a long-term presence on the moon, and it is much, much easier to build this network of satellites if you don't have to use giant mega rockets to get them to the moon. Instead, you put them in low Earth orbit, refuel them there, then get them out to geosynchronous orbit, refuel them again, and then get them to cislunar space where they can, in theory, refuel again. Also, this allows these satellites to stay in operation for a much longer period of time, meaning that the space junk problem becomes far less significant. So while I was attending Spacecom in Glasgow, Scotland, I had an opportunity to interview two companies who are working on creating this type of network, one of which is called OrbitFab and the other is called AAC Clyde Space. And people often ask me why I moved to Europe. Well, it's to cover things like this because the UK Space Agency and ESA are taking the lead in funding these types of companies companies far more than they are in America, and that's going to be very important to the future of mankind's space ambitions. So we're going to meet these folks right now. Good afternoon, folks. We're here at Spacecom having an opportunity to talk to some fantastic people. Some of you may recall the content that I've made about this company, but before I go any further, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Hello, I'm Jazz. I'm the Business Development Manager here at OrbitFab UK. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. No so, OrbitFab, you know, the, the main thing that a lot of people are interested in uh -huh. in regards to your company is your plan to provide long-term survivability for satellites by exactly. refueling them, repairing them. Can you tell us a little bit more about your plans in that regard? Yeah, of course. So essentially, as you nicely described, we're an in-orbit refueling service. So um, we're trying to you know, demonstrate refueling both in LEO and the GEO regime. So in LEO, we've got a mission, hopefully in 2027, looking to launch then, um, to be the first ever satellite-to-satellite um, -satellite refueling demonstration. Wow. So, yeah, in Leo, so that's really, really exciting. So we've got a lot of exciting programs here in the UK, sort of do tech development um, with, you know, our technologies, whether it be, you know, the actual capturing interface or the passive interface as well. So, yeah. How large are your operations in the UK and mm -hmm. worldwide? How many employees do you have? How many offices? That sort of thing. So... Where our parent company is US, so Orbit Fabbing. So, you know, that was founded in 2020, uh, 2018. And um, we were founded here in the UK as a subsidiary in 2022. So, last year, this time in the UK, it was just two people. So, we have grown exponentially from that. So, now we're at 16. Wonderful. We're based on Harwell campus. So, because of all the amazing programs that we've won with the UK Space Agency and things like that, now we're able to, you know, exp ex uh, expand that team. So, is that why? You you've expanded so much mm -hmm. in the UK is because mm -hmm. of what the UK Space Agency has offered and if so do you detect an interest from the UK Space Agency in what you do is that part of their mission yeah definitely I'd say that the in-orbit servicing market so that's sort of exactly what we're targeting with doing in-orbit refueling is definitely something that the UK Space Agency are sort of you know very very like sort of spearheading um, as well as sort of space sustainability as well that's very big here in Europe we want to make sure that we build a sustainable space we don't want people just launching up there and then forgetting you know once it's out of once it's out of fuel you can't reuse their satellites again so we want to make sure that we extend those mission lives mission um, operations um, you, you know if you've got a fully working bus but you've got no fuel to you know m maneuver around like that's sort of what we want to do we want to reduce that wastage and reuse that fuel fantastic do you have any plans to uh, refuel ion powered satellites mm -hmm. as well as using 
using conventional maneuvering thrusters? Of course. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a fuel agnostic solution. So it's in our tech roadmap. So, you know, we're not going to just stop right now. We've got Rafty, which is already space qualified for low pressure. So, you know, a hydrazine, we can, we can refuel that. But right now in the UK, we're developing high pressure variant as well for Rafty, which is their passive interface that I spoke about. So that essentially, we're trying to make that fuel agnostic. So to basically be able to refuel, you know, the, all the different propellant types that industry is going towards. So the green propellants, xenon, krypton, argon, and also nitrous oxides and things like that. Fantastic. Tell me more about Rafty. Mm. So Rafti is our passive interface. So essentially, you know, most satellites are equipped with a fill and drain valve. So what we want to do is we want to incorporate Rafti in place of a fill and drain valve. It has the same operation. So if you've got a fill, and, if you've got Rafti in place of that, you can still use it as a fill and drain valve. But with this, we'll actually be able to dock capture using our active interface with Rafti and then refuel you guys in space. Wow. So tell yeah. me about um, <clears throat> your relationship again back to the UK Space Agency because I've yeah, done yeah. a lot of interviews with them in regards mm -hmm. to space sustainability. What sort of specific contracts, awards, that sort of thing do you have with a space agency yeah. right now and are what are you working on? So as I just mentioned, so we've got quite a few. So the UK refuel emission, which is the demonstrating the first satellite to satellite refueling in Leo. Um, looking to launch in 2027 so that's the UK ADR refuel mission as well as our NSIP programs as well so that's something um, that we've recently announced in Farnborough so that is essentially um, funding to develop this technology that we've got to become a fuel agnostic sort of solution so we'll be able to sort of get GRASP which is our active interface as well to be fuel and pressure agnostic get that to breadboard level to engineering model level um, as well as Rafty as well so we've got we've got um, programs to do a lot of tech development with the, with, with the UK Space Agency. Last uh, question mm -hmm. um, in regards to, I'm assuming that your spacecraft is um, launch provider agnostic. However, mm -hmm. do you have plans to try to take advantage of the new launch vehicles that are coming out here in Europe? The RFA, Skyrora, yes. all these new companies. Uh -huh. Are you starting to talk to them about the possibility of launching okay. Rafty with one of those? Of course, of course, yeah. We are, we are, we are are in talks with quite a few of those companies. I've had lovely conversations, you know, with Skyrora RFA as well, um, including Orbex here and, um, you know, High Impulse as well. So really, really exciting stuff. So yeah, definitely will be. It'll be amazing to be able to, look, you know, make a UK sort of solution, which is something that we're also trying to do. Sort of have that solution UK based and manufacture it here and then, yeah. That's, that's, okay, I lied about the, about the last question. One more for you. Let's okay. say that I'm, let's say I'm just graduating from university. Let's say that I'm, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, a skilled engineer, something like that, and I'm mm -hmm. looking for a place to go. Is Orbit Fab still in the hiring mode? Or, and if so, who would you be looking for? Who do you want to bring on to your organization? Yep, so we've had, as I mentioned, we've had a big hiring rush, so we've increased, like, exponentially. Um, you know, spin turn programs as well so if you're in university we do spin internships with uh, catapult so that's essentially a summer internships for uni students to gain oh, some industrial experience and things like that so definitely people that are you know motivated and passionate about space and what we do as well space sustainability so that's sort of what we're looking for just people that you know really really want to really want to sort of have the future for space be part of the future so if they want to check into that intern program they just come to your website of course, yeah, yeah yeah so website or you know, the spin turn trip is through Catapult, so, you know, um, STFC, so essentially you can Google that. Um, I'll make sure the catapult is linked in the description for yeah, you folks. So in yeah. case anybody's interested in this program, mm -hmm. make sure to get you connected. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. No problem, I really Jordan. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.
Good afternoon. We are keeping extremely busy. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the yeah, viewers? Certainly. Hi there. So my name is Peter Anderson. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of a company called AAC Cloud Space. So I appreciate you taking your time to, to be with us today. So I would say the vast majority of my viewers and most people around the world really don't have an understanding of how much satellite manufacturing happens in Scotland. Can you tell me a little bit, just a little overview of the industry and also how your company contributes to it? A hundred percent, yeah. I mean, uh, Scotland once upon a time, and Glasgow in particular, used to be known as the centre of shipbuilding. And now it's very much becoming synonymous with uh, space shipbuilding as well, which is uh, something we're really proud of. Uh, the company I work for, the Scottish part of the business, because we're now global as part of sort of the ongoing consolidation in the industry. We've been here for about 20 years. We've built and launched around about 36 spacecraft to date. However, alongside some other companies that are in the country as well, uh, like Spire Global, Alba Orbital, there's approximately 20 to 30 spacecraft a year being launched that are being built here. Amazing. Now, outside of the US, is the biggest amount of spacecraft being done in this sort of geographical center. The US is by far, of course, right. launching more and more spacecraft, and, and, and we all know the individual who, who uh, does most of that yeah. himself. But, you know, more part to him, I suppose, yeah. in that regards. <laughs> <laughs> so is your focus the, the larger geosynchronous kind of satellites, or is it CubeSats? What do you guys specialize no, good, in? Good question. So we actually started off life weirdly building parts of spacecraft, and we actually addressed bigger spacecraft, maybe 400, 500 kilos. Over time, and, and the CubeSat form factor itself was only invented in 1999. Mm -hmm. That was in Cal Poly and Stanford Uni. Our founder, Craig Clark, who, who's no longer with the business, but still very much involved in the industry, he uh, took that and looked at it and said, I don't see why that has to be seen as a university thing. It's not a learning tool. It still remains a learning tool. It's still good for that. But he said, why can't we take that and apply the QO quality and the approaches that traditional space have to this? And essentially, that's what has made us famous globally. So now we build a range of what we call CubeSats. These go up to about 50 kilograms. Fairly well okay. known nowadays. Yeah. We've been doing that for the last 10 years or so. Up to then, it was just exclusively parts. More recently, um, we're actually now owning some of our own spacecraft uh, and now we launch those and we deliver services from those spacecraft. So very much this sort of space data as a service model. So you say you're global. Uh, where do you have a presence? How, mm. how many employees do you have? Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah, so we are founded and, and headquartered now in Uppsala in Sweden. We have businesses then obviously in Sweden, the Netherlands. We have a business in the US, actually just on the East Coast. Okay. We have a business in South Africa and then here actually in Glasgow. We literally six minutes away from where we're sat at the minute. Um, there's about 200 people globally. Wow. So I think in space that is a wow. I think if people yeah. said otherwise, you know, it's not that many people, but I think in the industry and in the context, it's actually quite a number of people. Um, we have a number of, like, obviously lots of young people coming through, really exciting for them. We actually have a number of people who've been with the business, like 15 years, 18 years, maybe even longer in some cases. So you actually find that the, the heritage and the experience we have is, is world leading. So tell me something, one of the big things that the UK Space Agency, that ESA, that a lot of people are focusing on, not as much in my country to be honest, embarrassingly, but it's the case, is the space debris issue, when satellites go dead, when they run out of fuel, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, what is your company doing to address those issues? Are you uh, building any relationships? You know, so yeah, no, that's a really good question because We've evolved the business to build, launch, operate, and, and deliver data from our spacecraft. Naturally, we've also had to develop the experience around the regulatory environment. So actually, we've been involved for a number of years now within the UK and some of our other businesses to help actually develop the new regulations and the new approaches to limit and mitigate the amount of space debris. We already had a really important aspect, which was the quality. So we don't tend to, we don't launch anything that doesn't work. So we're not really contributing to the space debris for you know the sake of just saying it's something works or not. All of our spacecraft are QA'd, they go through a rigorous test campaign, and actually they're up there to generate revenue more often than not for our customers. We also then operate within the usual guidelines, the Outer Space Act. More recently, we've been including propulsion and other technologies to after the useful life of the spacecraft. Some systems start to degrade after a number of years in orbit 
due to radiation. We actually now are looking to bring them back and burn them up mm-hmm. at that point. So right. not actually leave them up there any longer than they have to be. So you have some deorbiting plans. That's, in that's, that that's it, exactly. So and, and it's not quite as simple as simply saying we've got propulsion on board, although that is an important aspect of it. We actually do have to spend quite a lot of time um, looking around how we do it, how we safely, actively deorbit things as well. Right. Um, I think that's it. So we've had to develop a lot of skills, a lot of software, a lot of processes as well. So I've got two more questions for you. At number yeah. one, um, satellites it oftentimes benefit from ion propulsion, that sort of thing. Yep. Is your company looking into some of the more bleeding edge types of propulsion like electroplasma, that sort of thing, to, to, to maximize the use of your propellant? Or are you sticking with some of the older older designs? We, we actually maintain a sort of agnostic approach to propulsion. It's actually quite a specialist engineering discipline. Right. It's not one that we have necessarily built up the capacity to do. Luckily, the market itself is quite buoyant. There's lots of options out there. So we will fly anything from cooled gas through to electric-based uh, propulsion systems. Why would we do different things? It quite often depends on the payload. So for some of our RF missions and comms missions, the electric payloads can actually interfere with the performance of the payload. Ah, I see. So we'd look to use cooled gas there. And similarly on other missions, and again, each system, as is often the way in space, it's, it's a game of trades. Mm-hmm. So some are good for some things, some aren't good for others. There's certainly no perfect system out there. Right. Um, I'm assuming your, con- your company is largely a launch provider agnostic, and if That's so, right. then are you looking at some of these new emerging launch providers as the to take up your satellites, the RFAs, the Skyroras, the Orbexes, are they interesting to you? Oh, they are 100% interesting to us. They they offer two things for us. They, they both address the uh, decreasing capacity and increasing demand. Those are obviously very related. So they at least give us additional options to get our spacecraft into orbit. It helps to keep the industry itself uh, honest, right. you know, good competition is good for the industry. Um, we also then look at these uh, newer launch vehicles as giving us different options actually being able to launch spacecraft into specific orbits, which actually gives us the option, both ourselves and to our customers, to consider different ways of designing systems. Maybe we don't need as many spacecraft if we can put them exactly where we want them. Right, absolutely. Well, I uh, appreciate the no, time. No, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you so no, much. Very, very interesting. You're very welcome. And I uh, appreciate your time. Cool. Bye.